Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hakanoon Podcast. I'm your Afghanian host, Lingdao Smoke, CEO of Hakanoon. Uh, I'm just going to be here today for Amy Tom, a regular host. And we have with us Liz Eddy, a very special guest, the founder and CEO of Lantern. Round of applause. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the podcast, Liz. Afternoon podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm so happy to have you here. Yeah, just as we mentioned, you know, in our chat before the podcast, uh, I have to interview you. Like after reading your story and how you founded Lantern, uh, I told Amy that this is the one interview, the one uh, founder that I really, really want to interview. So thank you so much for coming uh, to join the chat with me today. Uh, first thing first, can you please tell the Hakkinen audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I feel like it's like where to begin when I was like two, five, twenty. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess whenever you, know, you chose. <laughs> um, I guess from like a a career perspective, um, I I've been building companies since I was fifteen. So I started my first organization, uh, really focused on dating abuse and domestic violence education for high school and university students. Built it with two of my really good friends. It's been running for more than half of my life now, which is pretty wild to recognize. Um, and really fell in love with the pace and the variety of running a startup and not knowing anything, and then learning as you go and meeting really smart people and um, and doing it all for a mission that I care deeply about. And so that kind of set me on a trajectory of really wanting to work in startups, wanting to work in mission-driven environments. Um, and so ended up working at a couple of nonprofits, starting with Do Something and then transitioning into Crisis Tax Line, which is the, um, I guess now, largest global crisis support line via SMS um, and was kind of the initial director of communications at the go-to-market strategy, um, really bringing the concept to life in the United States and then in three additional countries. Um, but have always had this like deep kind of nagging need to get involved in the end of life and grief space. Um, I lost my dad when I was nine. So it's always been um, a topic that I just hold very near to my heart, have seen how it impacts a family logistically, legally, financially, emotionally. Um, and it wasn't really until my grandmother passed away though, that I started to see like how I could really have an impact in the space, um, as a, a full-time job. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, um, as a, one of the caregivers for my grandmother, I was the one who got the initial phone call, um, when she passed away. And so I drove up to where she was living in a nursing facility in Connecticut, and um, was bet by two police officers, a nurse and her body. And they said, what do you want to do? And I was 27 uh, at the time. I had right. no idea what was supposed to be done. Sort of assumed that either like you just suddenly know like instincts kick in or there's someone there to tell you. Um, yeah. And the reality of it is, is you know exactly the same amount of information you did before it happened. Um, and if you're right. unprepared, you continue to be unprepared. Um, and so I pulled out my phone and I Googled, what do you do when someone dies? And um, fully expected something like my current company, Lantern, existed. I uh, was really looking for a site that could walk me step by step through everything around end of life and death. Mm -hmm. Expected it to be well designed, to have a great user experience, because that's what we get everywhere else, right? Like if you're getting mm -hmm. married, you're having a baby, or you're buying a house, it's like there are. 25 different companies to choose from. They're all beautifully designed. They're extremely comprehensive, right. They're really easy. They're affordable. Um, and then for the one thing that affects every single person on the planet multiple mm -hmm. times throughout their mm -hmm. life, uh, it was really fragmented and expensive and confusing. <laughs> and so, so wait a minute, what did you find on that Google search? Like, what did you actually see? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, uh, it'll, yeah, it'll be, it's, it's very localized information. Typically, mm -hmm. um, I came across a, um, a, a bunch of funeral home listings, local funeral mm -hmm. home listings, uh, mm -hmm. some blog posts from like five years earlier that had just right. been around for a while. And so they had good SEO. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I ended up doing, which like feels really ridiculous now, but I know it's, it's the case for many people that, that aren't using lantern, um, 
I just started calling from the top down the -hmm. funeral homes on that list. I didn't even know what to say. You know, when someone picked up the phone, I was like, I don't like, how do I start this conversation? Like, what do you open with? Cause they'll just say hello. Like, Oh, this is so-and-so funeral home. And you're like, uh, yeah, my entire life just changed. Like, can you help me (laughs) navigating that? (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And I was completely stumbling over my words. I was like, I, I, I mean, I truly, I think I said something to the effect of like my grandma died. I don't know what to do with the body. Help me. Like, I don't like yeah. just complete panic uh, mm-hmm. because it's not, it's not something we really think about until we have to. And then you're mm-hmm. thrown into this like logistical mayhem uh, of yeah. trying to figure it all out. And not to mention, you know, especially in the United States, uh, we have like terrible bereavement leave. We have very little support systems. We kind mm-hmm. of ignore that death is a thing until it's mm-hmm. you know, right smack in your face. So mm-hmm. you're typically taking care of kids, trying to manage your job, dealing right. with your own emotions of the experience. And then, right. you know, basically planning a wedding in a week. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what right. Yeah. Uh, and and instead all- of the joyful and, you know, like all, all the happiness that like a wedding you know, guests arriving and cheering for you, congratulating you would bring it. Basically, it's just like you depressed while you're doing it. And uh, I, I can't even imagine. I, I haven't gone through it myself, but just like I was shocked when reading uh, from your story, basically, that there has not up until Anton, like anyone who basically did it in like a nice, you know, walking you through navigating with you and just like helping you as a human kind of way like wow like how can that be I feel like as a society as a culture we don't prioritize grief um and like the downside of being a human like things like miscarriage is never talked about you know in our culture like even though it happens to like one out of like four um women and there has to be like a campaign you know from the women not like from companies but literally just from women saying that what I'm one out of four you know like listen to my story and I feel like it's the same way with uh, with death is like we don't for whatever reason feel comfortable talking about it or do something about it uh, until we have to like you mentioned absolutely and that's so much of yeah. what what lantern does like yes we yeah. build products that make things easier and yeah. uh, and yes we refer to services and you know, do all these things but really at its core we're trying to help people have these conversations and feel more comfortable and confident in these situations because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, before, before Lantern, you really, you kind of were on the scavenger hunt of trying to piece together all these different products and tools and services and mm-hmm. making a lot of guesses without a lot of education and then continuing to operate in a society that doesn't provide proper, you know, mm-hmm. and care in any facet. Uh, mm-hmm. and so a lot of what we push for outside of, you know, developing Lantern itself is, mm-hmm. uh, being a part of like the push for national bereavement leave in the United States. Like right now mm-hmm. there's no requirement for any kind of paid bereavement leave, uh, for a lot of, uh, workers in the United States, they can lose their job for taking off after the death of a loved one. Um, that is mind blowing to me. Like I I'm over here just thinking about paternity and maternity leave and how so fucked up it is that we already don't have that and don't treat parents like humans. Ah, never even occurred to me that it's the same way, but with people dealing with death and with grief, you know, a society that doesn't treat the birth of someone nicely probably doesn't treat the death of someone nicely either. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. We actually, we just launched launched this survey where we're asking people to anonymously review their company's bereavement policies and benefits. Yeah. And you know, like any kind of review, you kind of get like the best case and the worst case scenarios. And, right. um, and there are certainly companies that are doing a really great job, but the vast majority of the reviews that we're getting are people talk. And these are like big, well-established, very wealthy companies right. that are doing things like we had someone tell a story, uh, write a review that basically said this large company, um, she had five years of positive performance reviews and then her spouse died. And mm-hmm. she came back after a few weeks, which was, you know, what they, they allowed her to take. And she right. was having a really hard time readjusting afterward. Yeah. And she ended up being let go uh, because her, her performance slipped. And you know what? It's like, there's, there's got to be a better way to handle this. You know? I, oh my goodness. That is fucked up. That is just, I can't believe it. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Ah. 
And like couple of that with the fact that you are dealing, like, you know, grief is not linear. It is not something that you just, it happened to you, you get over it. And then it's like, it's overcome, right? Like it's, it's never had that way. It's like, will sneak back to you. Like couple that with the fact that you also have to deal with all this shit that life's going to throw to you at yeah. the same time. Oh my goodness. We oh, always goodness. remind that. We always remind employers and people who are supporting loved ones after a loss that like the person who's coming back is not the same person that left before their bereavement leave. Like this Mm. is an entirely deeply emotionally changed person. And you have, Mm. you have to be prepared for that. You can't just Mm. say, okay, like operate at your 100% that you were, you know, last month. Um, Right. Right. Here's your KPIs. Here's your next quarter performance review. Like be prepared for that. Oh man. All right. So walk me through that date in 2018 again. So like you have that phone call or multiple phone calls with the uh, funeral homes. And then it's like occurred to you that there has to be something to be done about this because apparently no one is doing like, what do you do next um, after that uh, realization? Yeah. So I, I, I spent some time researching cause I'm also a firm believer that if something great already exists, join it, don't duplicate it. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I spent some time looking at a lot of the companies that are in the space and doing really great and interesting things, but finding that, um, there was just a tendency, which is true in in tech in general, to kind of pick one aspect of a process and Mm. do that one aspect really well. And I think that's Mm. that's really, it's a a smart way to build a scalable business, right? To have your Mm -hmm. hook, have your wedge, and then you start to build out from there. Mm. But the reality of losing somebody is that you don't operate in these little silos. Yeah, you can't compartmentalize. Yeah, exactly. Logistics of death. No, it's it's all... It's yeah. a life experience. And it's exactly right. why, you know, when you look at a wedding site, they're not like, oh, we'll just help you find a wedding planner. They're like, no, right. we're going to help you find all of your vendors. We're going to do your invitations. We're gonna, Cause it doesn't make sense to use 20 or 30 different websites for, for this life event. Uh, right. And so it, you know, it wasn't like the, the concept of lantern as it stands today is the idea that came up in, in that moment. It has evolved dramatically mm-hmm. over the last mm-hmm. few years and, and in huge part based on, my team and my co-founder. So I, Mm -hmm. after going through this with my grandmother, the first thing that I did was I went to my now co-founder, literally Mm -hmm. walked into her apartment and she teases me about this all the time. And I was like, we've got to do something about death. She was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) What what do you mean? Stop it from happening. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, what what do you mean we have to do something about death? What is this? Um, And, and, you know, it's, I think it is, tempting at times, especially founders who go through a life experience to sort of feel like, oh, I represent the every man, the every person. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm going to build this product based on my experience. And the reality is, is the way I experience death and loss is not the way 99.9% of people have experienced death and loss. It is it's very unique from a variety of circumstances where you live in the world, your culture, your religion, your socioeconomic level, like, you know, like there's so many different reasons why you experience death in different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's tons of, you know, death inequities in the United States and, and, Mm -hmm. and abroad. Um, And so one of the biggest things for us when we started was to say, okay, I'm, I'm representing one experience. We need to get a collective understanding of what the primary problems are that people are facing for us, you know, in the United States, that's where we were focusing. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we started doing a ton of user research and we Mm -hmm. were interviewing people from all over the country that the only thing they had in common was that they had lost someone in the last 18 months and that Mm -hmm. they were the primary planner. Um, mm. and for the vast majority of them were people we had never met. We, we worked through a, um, like a matching company for user mm. research and what we heard over and over and over again was this, like, of course there's the sadness and depression and, and the grief associated with the loss, mm. but the primary thing that kept coming up was anxiety and it was anxiety mm. around not knowing what you don't know not being able to find the information quickly, not knowing who to trust through this process Mm -hmm. and sort of falling back on tradition, not because they felt like it was the right choice, but because they really just didn't know what else to do. And so, you know, like for- That's the only blueprint that there is, so- Exactly, like people go to the same funeral home generation after generation. They don't think about like, is this the right thing for me? 
can I afford this? Like, you know, right. those, those conversations don't really happen. It's just sort of like, this is what we do. And then we deal with the consequences and it might not be the right fit, but that's where we are. Um, mm-hmm. and so that was our, I think the biggest thing for my, my co-founder Alyssa and I was, you know, making sure we were setting out to build something that, that really addressed a lot, the larger experience of loss in the U S and, and how we can best approach, something that we can solve, right? Like we can't, mm-hmm. we can't fix grief. Like that is, that's right. going to be there. But what we can do is fix the anxiety around, mm-hmm. the, around the not knowing and take the logistics off of someone's plate so that they can focus on their grief. Mm-hmm. And they can mm-hmm. focus on their family and, you know, and the things that, that really matter during that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's like a common thread in your story of uh, since you were younger, uh, of just like seeing some kind of like big, larger societal uh, issues that you want to uh, you want to address, and then kind of do something about it. Not like fixing it, like you mentioned, like you can't fix that. There's like domestic abuse and violence, and like things that happen outside of your control. But like you can do something about it, just the same way that you addressing you know the grief and the dealing the anxiety, dealing with death uh, and logistics problem of like just like being there and being able to like help people going through it. Uh, what do you think explain that kind of drive to just like always want to, to do something about uh, societal issues? <laughs> is that like you were just born that way? Uh, is it, I don't know, like maybe your parents uh, or like your, your uh, environment, like what explains that? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's like anything else kind of a cross section of a lot of things um, partially just how I was raised. My mom mm-hmm. has been always been an activist, uh, mm-hmm. particularly, uh, she started a group called conversations on race where she's helping wow. people have discussions around racial inequities and racism and mostly mm-hmm. like suburban towns, uh, with, you know, mm-hmm. local m- parents and, and students. Um, and so watching her do that now she's, she's also very involved in, in animal rights activism. So, I, there's always yeah. been kind of an activism edge within my home and it's been very normal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that crossed with a lot of exposure to entrepreneurs. My grandmother's an entrepreneur, my mom's an entrepreneur. Mm. Uh, and, and also just, you know, there's always the privilege element, right? Like I, mm. I was, I always had the space to mm-hmm. experiment. I always mm-hmm. knew, like, I, I have an extremely supportive family, mm-hmm. both emotionally and financially where I know like mm-hmm. I can try things. And if mm-hmm. I fail, I have something to fall back on. I think that mm-hmm. that gives you a level of confidence to test and try things out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly a, a cross a cross section yeah. of a lot of things. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool to hear. It's like one of the aspects of your story that I was so much relating to is kind of this. I don't want to say naive, but like basically, I always think of myself at any point in my life. I could relate to me being sixteen eyes wide open going to this um, uh, this thing called the United Dual College, which has 200 students from 100 different countries for the first time from like a little town in Vietnam, going to that environment and being like exposed to like basically the injustices of the world and like all the different colors and diversities and stuff. And just like any point in my life, whatever I do, I can always relate back to that moment of being 16 and like being in India for the first time and like get introduced almost to like this path that I'm on right now and uh yeah it's just it's 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 interesting how life just takes us uh you know in different ways because you know I, I read your story and I'm like wow like she's basically been a social entrepreneur like you know for most of her life and that basically what I would identify myself as as well is like I want to do something not because um, society and like capitalism, you know, would tell me to do. And like, that is the way to make money. But like, I want to be able to make some kind of impact that is larger than, uh, than financial. So, uh, yeah, that, that is something that I think, uh, draws me a lot to, 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 you know, the, the way you approach the problem of death, but also like all the other, uh, times like you mentioned, uh, you and Elisa are like the kite in the string, and I'm just like, that is so beautiful. Like, can can you explain a little bit of that? Like, what what is what does that mean to have uh, a co-founder or like someone like a soulmate in in uh, you know in your entrepreneurial uh, journey that you can like always count on? 
yeah. <laughs> Having a good co-founder is like, I mean, if you don't have that, I, I don't know. It's like, I don't know where, like how you go forward. <laughs> I, I truly, it's yeah. very hard for me to visualize because it's, you know, doing something on your own is incredibly lonely and challenging mm-hmm. and you're, you know, pulled in many different directions, which is true, even if you have co-founders, but even mm-hmm. more so as a solo founder, um, and, and then having a co-founder that's not a good fit or that you don't trust mm-hmm. or that you don't learn from, or that you don't laugh with and have fun with, uh, also, you know, can be really the breaking point of, of a startup. And I know from, you know, doing a couple of rounds now of, of fundraising, venture capital fundraising, that so much of what pre-seed investors are doing is looking at the strength of the team, because in those early days, the co the co-founders, are what makes or breaks the business. Like that's it. Absolutely. That's all you have. That's how you have to go with, right? Cause like yeah. the product has it, it's, it doesn't have product market fit yet. Like you haven't figured out so many things, but if you have a strong yeah. team, you'll be able to get through a lot of those challenges and work through them together. And with mm-hmm. Alyssa, like we've been, we've been friends since I guess, 2012. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we became friends from working together, which I think is mm-hmm. a really powerful way to, to find a co-founder is like, mm-hmm. you know, we, we worked together. We gave each other a lot of feedback. We, you know, we were right. colleagues and through that became very good friends. So mm-hmm. we're very used to having a working relationship. We don't, we, we always assume best intentions in each other. We aren't offended mm-hmm. when one of us disagrees with the other or wants to change mm-hmm. something or, you know, has a different expectation. It's, we're very, yeah. very comfortable with that. Um, but the, you know, the kite and string example that you're talking about, uh, yeah. We, uh, so we have, yeah, we have our matching tattoos. <laughs> oh my goodness. Stop it. You do. <laughs> oh, you know, now that you mentioned, I did not expect anything less. Yeah. <laughs> of course you have matching tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that metaphor, it, um, it's, we get asked often, you know, how do you kind of divide and conquer as, mm-hmm. Uh, as co-founders and, you know, division of responsibility is so important. And, you know, we very much see it as we have, we have our division of responsibility. We have our division of strengths, but one can't operate without the other. And I am, as I think a lot of CEOs are, I'm very like, big picture, lots of ideas. Like I get super hyped up and energized by conversations and I'm always pulling things from different, uh, conversations and things I've read. And I'm like, we need to do this and try this and think about this. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that is important. It's an important L you need that in a startup, right? You have to always mm-hmm. kind of have that innovation yeah. going, but if that's all you have, you're not going to have anything. It's going to be total oh, yeah. chaos with no focus. <laughs> yeah. So the, the metaphor uh, I use, not metaphor, but like the, the words that we use between me and David, uh, kind of similar is uh, the explorer and the exploiter. So I'm the exploiter in the, in the pair Basically, I make sure that we do everything. We have food on the table, the light is on, and the team is not like dying. <laughs> not to like be dramatic, but like David would be like, you know, partnerships and like explore all kinds of new territories and like think about like, you know, two years from now, 10 years from now, like what else we can do, you know, all the big picture, like you mentioned. And I think like it also works well in our case, even though we're not like founders relationship, we're basically the runner of the shelves. So we like leading a team. It's important to have someone who keep the team grounded and who keep things moving. And then it's also important to steer the ship right like to move the thing in the direction and like not get too caught up in like all the day-to-day so that is perfect that you have someone yeah, like that in your team exactly yeah. is extremely grounded she's extremely yeah. thoughtful she's extremely mm-hmm. thorough she mm-hmm. she has and she has a really great way of like and this is true for our whole team, not just for me. She has a really powerful way of not like stomping on people's ideas, mm. but trying to keep us like organized and moving forward. So it's not like, you know, you come to her with an idea and she's like, no, 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 no. It's more yeah. like this is really interesting and great. Okay. Here's where, you know, where our, our next quarter is, where the next year is, and maybe we can move these things around and maybe this thing should wait. And she's like, she's very good about making you feel like heard and supported and understood while also like 
keeping the ship moving in the right direction. <laughs> oh, that is so awesome. Okay, after reading your story, I will basically want to be best friends with you. And then after like this interview, I basically also want to be best friends with her. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you can be friends with both of us. <laughs> but for real though, maybe if we ever like in New York, or, like if you ever in Colorado, uh, we definitely should should like meet up in person for real. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. We are, we're big Hacker Noon fans. It's awesome. Uh, it was okay when, we, when we first saw it, um, I, that, it was the first time I had been introduced to Hacker Noon and mm-hmm. I wrote to our engineers and I was like, Hey, yes. you guys know about Hacker Noon? And they're like, of course we do. <laughs> that's oh, like, that's that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after four years that never gets old. Like every time someone says that they know Hacker Noon or like I go somewhere and like on the computer, they're reading one of our stories. I'm just like, get this kind of butterfly feeling in my tummy still. Uh, yeah, I don't think that will ever go away, but I- I'm just so happy. So the reason why we found you and Lantern and like this beautiful story of how you founded the company is basically we have this uh, running campaign. Uh, it's been going on for two months now called Startups of the Year. And Lantern was uh, actually nominated as one of the best startups in Brooklyn, New York. So uh, yeah, just so our audience know, like they can go to startups.hackernoon.com and find Brooklyn. If like you resonate with Liz's story or you just want to check out what, you know, um, what it's like to have a company that basically is like the wedding planning site, but version of like death, <laughs> of funeral planning. And <laughs> that's what I gather from like the way you just de- describe it. I, I, I thought it's, it's pretty comprehensive because a lot more people would understand what it's like to like wedding plan if like they have ever gone through it. Uh, then yeah, like you can check out uh, Lanta now and, and maybe go give them a vote. Um, as for, I guess like concluding the, the conversation, do you have any, uh, hmm, let me see what's a good kind of leaving note. Um, for any like aspiring entrepreneurs out there, uh, especially like, any aspiring like female entrepreneurs uh, out there like do you have any kind of advice uh you know maybe any tips for for them to like go ahead to do what they uh what they're meant to do yeah well first of all like do it I would be, I, it's, I mean, it's mind blowing to me how only about 2% of venture capital goes towards female businesses at this point. Uh, There, there's no lack of exception. This is not like a pipeline issue. (laughs) Like there's no lack of exceptional female entrepreneurs out there. And so I was like pushing, connect, support each other, reach out to me. I mean, I, I really do try to uh, elevate and make introductions and and kind of push forward Mm -hmm. um, other founders. And so, yeah, I, I, if you need that encouragement, I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm available and excited to, to support Mm -hmm. people's progress. You Um, know, recently I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but recently I learned a stat that uh, all companies started out, like 40% of companies started out being founded or like run by a female uh, entrepreneurs, but because of the uh, disconnect between VC money uh, and companies, you know, it turns out like two percent of total companies uh, got uh, that ad run by females got funded, which is kind of crazy because it's not like for the lack of companies being started by females, it's exactly the, that bridge between funding mm-hmm. and uh, and companies being run by females that is lacking. And like I listened to this podcast, uh, Planet. Planet Money podcast where this person tried for 48 hours to use only female founded company products. So like, you know, things like status chips, which basically was started by this person called Stacy. And then now it's not, uh, it's not run by Stacy anymore. And like by a man, but you know, try so hard to like, just follow the track of companies and, you know, pasta, tomato sauce, toilet paper founded by companies, and basically she could not do it. Like after 48 hours, she had to give up because there's just not enough products out there uh, that, you know, are run by, by a company or, or, you know, continue to be run by a company for her to continue that streak, which is also mind blowing to me. But, it really, it really, it yeah. really is. And so we need more of us. We need to support each other. Absolutely. Uh, and I also, for, you know, people that are, you know, further along, even if it's just a step ahead, like making sure you help other people up and yes, and help yes. them forward as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Okay, thank you so much, Liz. Um, you know, this is, has been a short conversation, but I enjoy every single minute of it. Uh, and I hope that number one, uh, Lantern continues to be successful and you achieve whatever you know you set out to do for this year, but also for the next years to come. And number two, maybe Lantern will win startups of the year in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> that is yeah. something that we uh, can help with the audience. Like, listen, if you have one of the 300 people that happen to listen to this podcast, why don't you go ahead to startups.hackenon.com and find Lantern right now? Um, you know, maybe something yeah. will happen. Some Thank good thing you. will happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you, Liz. This has been an episode of the Hackenon Podcast. It was hosted by me, Linda Smoke, joined by Liz Eddy at Lantern, and edited by our uh, editor, Alex Cobb. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>